This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. In our previous session together last time, we made mention of the idea of the style of question that has now been brought into the taxation paper, attempting to, as this note here says, bridge the gap between the taxation, the UK taxation paper, and the advanced taxation paper, bringing more planning style. Now, what does tax planning mean? It means, of course, we're trying to mitigate the tax burden of a taxpayer. Here in individual or individuals, in corporate tax, obviously the corporation tax liabilities of companies. We're trying to mitigate that tax liability. We're trying to reduce that tax liability. Of course, we'll be doing it in a legal way. Again, if you've read anything out of chapter one as yet, which you may not, what we're able to do in terms of tax avoidance is to arrange our taxation affairs as taxpayers in a way as to mitigate our tax liabilities. What we cannot do is to move over the fence from tax avoidance to tax evasion. Evasion is evil indeed there, where we're deliberately doing something that is not allowed to avoid paying tax. For example, not disclosing information about a source of income that we have or making a statement that we've incurred expenditure that we have not. That is tax evasion. That you can't do. But basic tax avoidance is permitted in terms of arranging your taxation affairs in such a way as to reduce your overall taxation liability. And we saw that in the previous session when dealing with spouses or civil partners, specifically in relation to income producing assets. The heading that we saw was joint income that arose from a jointly owned asset, where we saw what the rules were. The rules were, and are, that if you have civil partners or married couples having joint ownership of an income producing asset, then in terms of how do we deal with each spouse's or civil partner's income tax computations, it was very simple. We applied the basic 50-50 rule and we just split that income equally between them. There was an election, of course, to change it from the 50-50 to a basis of the actual ownership. Now that, of course, must be information provided to you. Is it actually own, owned between the two spouses other than 50-50? 60-40, 75-25, 80-20, whatever it might be, that split. So an election was available to move to an actual ownership. But we went further than just looking at, do we have a jointly owned asset? Should we therefore make that declaration, that claim, that election to move to an actual ownership basis of splitting the income rather than just on a simple 50-50 basis? We also saw, what about if one of the spouses or civil partners actually owns the asset outright? Typically a property there, as we saw in the example that we finished the last session with. And that income going to that taxpayer, certainly in any exam question anyway, is inevitably something like a higher rate taxpayer. And the spouse is not a higher rate taxpayer. They may not even be a taxpayer. In that example of Elton and David, we saw that Elton was a higher rate taxpayer and David had no income at all therefore a completely unused personal allowance. Therefore, it was an obvious thing to do. What we could do, move the entire ownership of the asset from the one spouse or civil partner to the other, taking income out of either higher rate or basic rate and moving it down to either basic rate or no taxation at all, because the individual was not in fact a taxpayer like David in that previous example. And that could save significant amounts of tax, as we witnessed in the calculations that we did. So we've got our first taste, therefore, of action that could be taken of a tax planning nature to mitigate the tax liability of spouses of married couples. And from last time to this, I've asked you to do a little bit of reading out of chapter 26, where we get an introduction to and a discussion of and examples of these tax planning style questions. Now there's various different areas. And again, we are not able to, for example, start to talk about these 
multi-tax questions at this point in time, though I've made brief reference to the capital taxes, and I'll remind you of that again in a moment. We are only at the moment looking at our first chapter in terms of one tax, income tax. So very difficult to look at this stage in our studies at a multi-tax problem. But I did introduce into the idea of moving ownership of an asset in for or in part from one spouse to another, that when you move an asset from one taxpayer to another, you do have to consider other taxes. Those two taxes being the capital taxes, capital gains tax and inheritance tax. And as we said then, as, and as we see in these notes indeed made here, what we have when we move assets between spouses is in fact no difficulties, no problems arise as regards the capital taxes. Because we said that for capital gains tax purposes, it would be dealt with as a no gain, no loss transfer. So no gain arising on the transfer or spouse. Basically, it transfers at the cost of the transfer or becoming the cost then to the transferee. It transfers at cost rather than at market value. We also then said that there'll be no IHT problems. Why? Because transfers between spouses or civil partners are exempt. So that was a multi-tax problem. In order to achieve a saving in income tax, we couldn't ignore all other taxes. We had to consider the prospect of would there be other tax issues. Now, there are other tax issues, the capital taxes, but neither of those capital taxes present a taxation problem because neither capital gains tax nor IHT liabilities would arise as a result of the transfer. So we had to consider multi-tax there. Now, once you have gone through all of your studies here, this is why chapter 26 is the last chapter dealing with tax planning. Once you've gone through all of the taxes and you have a thorough understanding of each of the taxes, then many more of the scenarios that are mentioned within this chapter may be dealt with. But at this point in time, we are looking at one particular area. It is, of course, this area of married couples or civil partners. Now, the note above this that introduces this, it says, uh, the introduction of both savings income and dividend income nil rate bands has made the question over the transferability of income producing assets from one spouse or indeed civil partner to another a more interesting problem as compared to the main issue before this introduction of what we saw in the previous uh, lecture simply moving those income producing assets from a higher rate taxpayer to a basic rate taxpayer or even from higher or basic to a spouse or civil partner who has not fully used their personal allowance. Again, that example 16 that we did at the end of the previous session. What we may see now, and that is what is picked up in this particular section here, is that it might, and it sounds counterintuitive this, we might be able to save tax by moving certain income producing assets from the lower tax paying spouse to the higher tax rate paying spouse, which sounds odd. Why would you move a source of income that at the moment may be being taxed at 20% to the other taxpayer spouse, where we think as a higher rate taxpayer, it would be taxed at 40%. But of course, if we think about savings income, if we think about dividend income, we've had the introduction of savings income and dividend income nil rate bands. And what that means is, though yes, the one spouse is a higher rate taxpayer, they'll only be that after they have utilized their nil rate band. So if we could move income to the higher rate taxpaying spouse, but who won't pay that because of their nil rate band, currently unused, then that is a sensible idea. It will achieve a tax saving. And that's what you read about, I hope you read about, between last session and this one here. Okay, let's just again review through what we've got there for in these notes. Now, it refers back to the section, in fact, it's section seven of chapter two, not section six. Again, 
hopefully by the time that you're looking at this, that's been updated anyway. Dealing with income producing assets owned jointly by spouse or civil partners illustrated the tax advantage to be gained from transferring that ownership again, such as a income producing a rental property from a higher rate taxpayer to a basic rate taxpayer spouse. Again, even greater savings when the transferee spouse was not even a basic rate taxpayer, as with the David and Elton example with the uh, unused personal allowance. This would allow income that would have been taxed at 40% to now be taxed at 20 or indeed not taxed at all. We've said this now many times in terms of the notes we've seen. The transferor spouse could transfer the entire ownership of the asset to the transferee spouse, such that all future income would be taxed in the computation of the transferee spouse. And in most circumstances, so the ones that we've seen anyway, that would achieve the highest taxation advantage moving from 40% to 20 or 40% to 0%. But possibly there is a degree of reluctance on the uh, part of the current owner of that income producing asset, as it may be of very significant value, such as a property from which the rental income derives, to actually lose the entire ownership. So what we might do is to put it into joint ownership. Could transfer therefore any party interest in the asset to make it jointly owned and then you'd move to your 50-50 rule on joint income. So although you wouldn't be moving all the income across and achieving greater tax savings, it would at least achieve some tax savings on half of that income. We make the point here about the capital taxes, though being an issue, not a problem. Again, Mark scored in terms of a written question and making those statements. What we're not yet able to uh, deal with, though again we may have mentioned it last time, is when dealing with capital gains tax, again it's a concept but we, do, we have no detailed knowledge at all at this point, that what you might do is to move an asset across from one spouse to another, not to provide a, a lower income tax rate on future income from that asset, but as a prelude to a sale of that asset whereby by the transferee spouse selling to the outside world, a lower CGT liability would arise than if the existing owner of that asset were to sell. We could change it from maybe a CGT rate of 20% to 10%, or maybe 20% down to 0%, because like we have a personal allowance in income tax, a level of tax-free income, so too do we have an annual exempt amount in CGT. Again, a level of tax-free gains. But we'll see more about that, of course, when we look at chapter 12. But as we've said, the introduction of these new rate bands for savings income and dividends income has now created opportunities for further tax saving, though we will see with these examples, it's not a very significant tax saving. We're not in the realm of thousands or several hundred, we're in the realms of just a few hundred here. Now, every little helps, and although it may not be a huge amount, it's the principles that, of course, concern us when it comes to dealing with examination questions. And as the examiners have written themselves about these issues, it's important that we take that on board, for it may form the basis of an examination question. So the idea, therefore, opportunities to reduce overall charges to income tax may give an advantage to transferring such income from a basic rate taxpayer spouse to a higher tax rate paying spouse. Okay, illustration one therefore here gives us our uh, married couple uh, by the names of Donald and Teresa here and they have regular annual income as follows. Now what we're used to from a tax planning perspective is seeing that one spouse or one civil partner in a civil partnership is a higher rate taxpayer and the other one is a basic rate taxpayer. And the basic objective is, is to move income, any income that is movable in the context of an investment producing, uh, sorry, the income producing investment asset. We would want to move it from the higher to the basic rate taxpayer spouse. But that's not possible here. We can see that Donald with his salary is a higher rate taxpayer. You can see the detailed calculations here. They're not difficult, of course with his salary of 70,000 and 12,500 personal allowance, 
taxable income 57,500, clearly a higher rate taxpayer by some distance. Uh, Theresa, on the other hand, is going to be a basic rate taxpayer when we put together her three sources of income, the salary, the interest and the dividends, that's a mere £29,000 there, and take away the personal allowance again, then the taxable income is well down in the basic rate band at uh, just £16,500 there. Now, what we have is this intriguing proposition, as we saw at the end of the previous note prior to this illustration, that we could find, it's not much, but some tax advantage here in moving the dividend income and savings income from the basic rate taxpayer to the higher rate taxpayer spouse. Now, by this our first sight there, first hearing, it's a ridiculous proposition. But of course, we won't be moving it from 20% to 40%, or whatever the percentage rate may be. Obviously, dividend income is different there, 7.5%, a much lower rate. But we wouldn't be moving it from the lower to the higher rate. We'd be moving it from the savings income in basic rate at 20% would now be moved over to a higher rate taxpayer spouse, but only sufficient to absorb their savings income nil rate band. Now that would mean, of course, setting up a separate account in the name of Donald here. Again, if we have joint income, it's just split 50-50. We may not want to do that. Given that, we only for a higher rate taxpayer, such as is Donald, we've only got uh, £500 savings income nil rate band. And we don't want to end up paying higher rate tax on the savings income. We're looking to take advantage of that savings income nil rate band. Again, as Donald is a higher rate taxpayer, that would only be £500 there. Now you have the uh, practical issue of uh, knowing it, what uh, interest bearing securities, the exact amount, whether or not in terms of that's a bank deposit or whatever, and therefore the interest rates change. Interest rates aren't very high, of course, at this point in time. Um, but the concept, which is all you have to deal with for an exam question, is clear. If you can move income from where it's being taxed to where it's not being taxed, in terms of an intra-spouse transfer, that makes very, very good news. Now here, the amounts are small, the tax rates are low. So in relation to that savings income, again here we just introduced it, as we said, normally be the case for tax buying purposes, to see if any investment income could be moved from the higher rate to the basic rate tax power. Not possible, because Donald doesn't have any such investment income. But now we've got these nil rate bands being introduced, both in terms of savings income and dividend income. It means that in the above example, tax savings can be achieved if firstly, £500 of the interest income could be made by Donald. A 500 because as we've said, as Donald is a higher rate tax payer, therefore use his savings income nil rate band of 500 that is currently being wasted. This income is being taxed at 20% on Teresa, as she has savings income well in excess, of course, of a nil rate band of 1,000, and she does not benefit from the 0% starting rate for savings income, as she has more than £5,000 of taxable non-savings income. We know that she has a salary of 18,000. The personal allowance would be deducted from that first of all. 18 minus 12 and a half is 5,500 there. And what that means is that the first 5,000 of taxable income is all non-savings income. So none of the savings income, none of the interest falls within the first 5,000 pounds of taxable income. Therefore, the starting rate is not applicable in this circumstance. But again, another issue to look for in another question, that use of the starting rate. So she does not benefit from the 0% starting rate for savings income, as she's got more than £5,000 of taxable non-savings income, as we've just seen, 5,500 to be precise. 
So that saving would be £100. £500 of income taxed at nil instead of 20%, £100. Now, as I say, the numbers aren't large. But in exam question, it's principles that are earning you marks. Obviously, here, the amounts are nowhere near as much as if we had property income, as we saw previously in our discussions, where we could be talking several thousand pounds of income being taxed at 20% instead of 40%, or even zero instead of 20 or 40%. That brings savings of thousands of pounds. Here, it runs into just a, a few hundreds. The second transfer would be of, and here it gets more tricky to try and plan this out, would be of sufficient shares to move up to £2,000 of dividend income from Theresa to Donald in order that both may use their dividend income nil rate bands of up to 2000 Currently, Theresa is being taxed at 7.5% on £7,000 of dividend income. We know she's got 9000 minus the dividend income nil rate band is 7000 all in the basic rate band and therefore taxed at the dividend rate of 7.5%. So here, uh, being taxed on the dividend income there at 7.5%, so a tax saving of 150, 000, uh, sorry, £150 would be possible here, 2000 at 7.5% being the amount of tax saving. Now again, it's not a huge amount. In practice, in reality, it would be difficult to get that precise figure for the future, because you do not know what profits of uh, companies are going to be. You do not know. You do not know what future dividends declared will be. So very difficult to be precise about that. But again, we're not dealing with the real world. We're dealing with an examination question. The planning point there is moving income. Yes, from a basic to a higher rate tax paying spouse would not appear to make sense. Other than that, it is to take advantage of these nil rate bans that in the hands of the higher rate taxpayer it are not being used. As we say, the practical issues here of moving sufficient uh, of an investment across into the hands of the other spouse to generate those very precise levels of income in the transferee spouse here for Donald, that's going to be tricky to achieve. Clearly, if we had the situation where if Donald, in addition to his salary, had, say, annual property income of 10,000. We're back to the situation that we saw in our husband and wife example previously. In his computation, this income would all be taxed at the higher rate of 40%. Teresa, even before the transfer of some of her interest income and dividend income to utilise Donald's savings income and dividend income nil rate bands, She's only a basic rate taxpayer. She's only got £16,500 of taxable income. Therefore, an obvious one, if Donald was to transfer the ownership of the property to Teresa, then the £10,000 property income would be taxed at 20% in her hands rather than 40% in his hands. A tax saving, therefore, of 10000 at the difference of 20% and therefore £2,000, a much more significant number. That would be achieved. Remember also, as we said before, though we have not yet dealt with the capital taxes in terms of any lecture, it would be a no gain, no loss basis for CGT. That's where it is a chargeable asset. Again, not all uh, income producing assets will necessarily be chargeable. Cash that goes into a deposit account and investment there is not a chargeable asset. Shares that produce dividend income, well, they are, of course, chargeable assets. Properties, chargeable assets there, and therefore gains that would otherwise have arisen if it was transferred by an individual to a third party. That doesn't happen when it's a transfer between spouses or civil partners. It is, as we've said here, no gain, no loss basis for CGT and an exempt transfer for IHT. Now, once you've looked at those taxes, once we've dealt with those together, those terms will become way more familiar to, them, to you. But do be careful. We're not saying here that they're just exempt full stop. No, it's exempt for IHT, but a very precise technical 
statement to make for capital gains tax purposes is that the transfer between the spouses is a no gain, no loss transfer. Don't call it exempt. The outcome is the same, but they will be looking for precision in terms of your terminology here. CGT equals no gain, no loss transfer and IHT, it's an exempt transfer there. But again, more of those when we come to them in our later chapters. OK, so we should therefore now be able to see how to take advantage of being married, I suppose, there or in a civil partnership. I'm sure there's lots of advantages. But how in tax terms, the ability to move ownership of an income producing asset from one taxpayer spouse to another to get either that income taxed at a lower rate or even better not taxed at all that exists for you and those movement of those assets will be nigh will be benign in terms of both CGT and IHT okay just a little bit there on tax planning in terms of this chapter 26 we'll be dipping into this chapter again at further points in terms of these studies we don't have separate lecture on chapter 26. It is about bringing things that we do in these earlier chapters together. So as we go through and deal with those issues, we'll uh, revert back to these particular notes. OK. That you'll be pleased to hear means that we've only got uh, one other lecture to come in relation to this huge chapter two, which introduces us, has introduced us to the income tax computation. And that will be coming up next.